We're going to start with focus groups. <coughs> Why do we use them? Well, if we want to do marketing, if we're planning, if we're doing a film screening, if we're uh, wanting to see how um, individuals feel about a certain product, they're a great way to get a group of people together. And we say that they're for larger groups, anywhere from 6 to 15. But they're a great way to get a larger group of people together and just ask them the questions. We're trying to find out individuals' opinions <coughs> about something. We want to find out what they believe. We can find out their knowledge base out of that a little bit. Um, but the idea is you get a group of people from a certain demographic or a certain area and you're just trying to probe a little bit and find out their thoughts, their beliefs, their feelings, okay? Um, when we started digital media production, we did focus groups with a number of our students in digital media production because why? Well, they, I take that back. They weren't in digital media production. Yet. They were broadcast media and journalism. But we were looking to form digital media production. Why wouldn't we talk to those students? Why wouldn't we talk to students in public relations or in communication studies? To find out what's going to be best in the future. But why would we talk? We want to find out what would be best in the future, but why would we talk to these journalism and broadcast media students? Sarah? Because they're more closely related to the field that your yeah. degree was being formed for. They're in the field, and we're going to merge these two programs. And we're trying to find out what works, what doesn't. What classes are we offering right now? Because you're talking about two full majors. You can't put everything from these two full majors into one. What do you feel like you're lacking? What do you believe from your, when you did your internship, what skills did you believe, did you feel would be your most beneficial that you're not getting right now? I'll come right back to you. Um, one of the questions we asked them was, if you had an outlet for your creative work, if you make a, a movie or if you do a newscast and you had to publish that or broadcast that somewhere, would that encourage you to work harder on it? Would that help the learning? We got a resounding yes, okay, because we didn't have those options at that time. So we're trying to find out what they think so we can figure out, okay, as we merge these two programs, what classes do we keep, which classes do we jettison, which classes do we adjust. Now, did we just talk to students? No. We also talked to alums who were out in the profession. We also talked to business le or to leaders in communication to find out from them what they liked. Because why? Well, if you talk to students, quite honestly, you may get a lot of, well, I didn't like that class because it was boring. Well, it may have been boring, but the content was vital. You know, we just need to think about how we're teaching the class. So we're not going to jettison it, we may just have to tweak that class. Okay? Now, on, on focus groups, when you talk about for larger groups, 6 to 15, and I didn't know if it had been discussed before, can with focus groups, can you have larger focus groups up to, uh, is there a limit that you would want to stay within? Is six, six, to, six to 15. Now, what about multiple focus groups? Do multiple. Okay. Yeah. Because I was thinking, you know, male, female. Or... Right. Exactly. And that's the next point I was going to make is just because you're doing a focus group at six to 15, don't think, God, that's only six people, 15 people. That's not very many I'm talking to. Well, we didn't do one focus group with journalism and broadcast media students. We did like eight. We went to eight different classes. And then we did two or three with the professionals. The reason you do six to 15 people in a focus group is why? So that was kind of a passive way of asking that question, wasn't it? So you can talk to them a little bit more individually one-on-one? -on -one. Yeah, it's more manageable. It's more manageable. If you get too many people in a room, how many of you have had an intro to mass comp? Yeah, that's what we meant. Okay, well that's a class that typically has 60, 70 people in it. How much discussion do you think we're going to get into in there? In here, we could get into some. Okay. You're also going to have a lot more diversity in race, in, well, not, I guess gender, in sexual orientation, in socioeconomic background. There's going to be a lot more diversity in a large group like that. Okay. You can, this way, if you do it in a smaller group, you can get more similar groups together in one, and then you do another one with this similar group, because we're trying to find out, well, how do men and women differ here? Okay, now how do men and women differ in later stages in life differ here? And how do men and women from different socioeconomic backgrounds differ? Okay. 
you know, one of the it's one of the reasons for breaking it into several groups instead of everyone having a super group. Another reason, so whatever happened in this group will not be influencing these people. Because the dynamic may take off here that cannot be stopped. And then it's like, going to get out of that one. Not really, because if that's, that's going to be the case no matter what size. In six people, you could have one person who just dominates the conversation. And you're going to have to, you don't want to back that person down because you don't want to throttle anybody. You don't want to stop anybody's idea. Plus, in fact, if I'm stopping that person, somebody else who's kind of quiet may think, oof, I don't want that to happen to me. I'm not speaking up. Okay, so you, you want it to go. So it's not so much for that reason. It's just because it's much more managed. More people get a chance to talk. You're going to try and get everybody to speak. You're going to try and get everybody to have some input. Otherwise, why are they there? The free pizza? Okay. Don't give them very good pizza. You know. You want to get them talking so you have more... A uh, couple things to keep in mind. First thing you need to do is to find your purpose. What is the purpose of this focus group? You know, you heard me talking about you're looking for differences between two groups. Yes and no. When we're looking at difference questions, that tends to be quantitative method. Uh, quantitative method. Okay, we're looking for specific differences between groups. But you can see by taking your notes, by looking at the transcripts and things, you can tell that women offered this kind of response. Men offered this kind of response. The women were very passionate in theirs. The men really were, eh, yeah, I guess so. Okay, so you're looking for those types of things. Establish a timeline. Why would that be important? Is that for them answering the questions? or The whole process. The whole process okay. yeah. When we're going to schedule it, when we're going to do it, when we're going to look at the results, when we're going to tabulate everything. Why is the timeline important? So you have organization. So you have some organization. You know where you're going. You get some more information. You're not wasting people's time. We had a couple of students last semester who did um, focus groups for their thesis. And when they were setting them up, they said, well, we could probably get, I can get these couple of people this time, and I come back and get these couple of people at that time, and if they can't make it, they come you're going to be chasing your tail trying to get that organized, okay? And you've got people, why are you doing focus groups if you're going to do it that way? Just do in-depth interviews. You need to get this group of people and give them a set time. And you know the, the little doodle calendar that you can do on Google Drive now? You can do it that way, but you need to set a time and say, this is when we're doing it, who can make it? And if, like, half your group that you plan on can't make it, go find some others to fill in that gap. Um, generate the questions beforehand. You want about four to seven questions. Take about an hour to two hours, but you need to have those questions beforehand. How come? You don't want to get caught trying to make it questions on the fly that won't be that good. You don't want to be making questions up on the fly. You may come up with some questions on the fly just based off of their responses. Okay, what else? Well, also you're planning your research. And your research has to be based on some fundamental questions. And if you don't have those fundamental questions, then maybe your research isn't going to be as strong. Once again, your research is only as strong as your design. Nothing worse than I go an hour or two hours for this focus group. Everybody leaves and I go, oh, crap. I had that question I wanted to ask. I forgot to ask it. Yeah. Have a plan. Plus, if I'm doing multiple focus groups, I need to ask them the same things. So if I don't have my questions planned, and I just let the conversation dictate what I'm asking, I'm not going to get the same results or even similar results from those two groups, likely. Questions need to be open-ended, because again, you want them to give you some detail. You need to go from general to specific. So think about if we're screening a film in a focus group, we're going to show the film. And the first question we're going to ask was, what did you think? Very basic. What did you think? And give our audience a chance to talk about it. And then we might get into, what did you think about the character development? What did you think about the costume? What did you think about the women's costumes? And we start getting more specific as we're trying to figure out what was good, what wasn't. Maybe we need to think about what we need to get to. One of the reasons I do these screens is 
Okay, what worked, what didn't? What do we need to kick out? What do we need to add in? Make sure those questions match your purpose. If my goal when I'm doing this screening is to decide, okay, how am I going to market this film? I need to be thinking about what they liked and what this group is that I have. Because if I'm looking at a group of college-age students, traditional college-age students, sorry, Bob. If I'm looking at traditional age college students, then I'm going to ask these questions, and they're going to be able to tell me, now, how, what do they like? Okay, that's how I'm going to market it to this group. Now, if that college age group is not my target audience, why am I doing a focus group with them? They're not my target anyway. I may be thinking about, I want to do a focus group with them, so my main target audience is the 40 to 50 group, but I want to get as much as I can, so I'm going to see if I, there maybe there's another way to market to them, maybe another way of releasing it to them. Okay, so keep that in mind. Do go ahead and develop a script. Your introduction, how you're going to introduce your, your uh, focus group, how you're going to talk to your audience, get them involved. Set up some ground rules. Select a facilitator. Why should you not be the facilitator? You as the researcher, why should you not be the facilitator? <coughs> you can bias your study by, like, if someone starts answering the question a certain way, and you kind of want that answer to be in your eventual project, you can just start focusing on them and trying to get them to say a certain something. Okay. So if like what you're saying is if somebody's giving me the answers I want, the feedback yeah. I want, so I'd like to keep leaning toward that. Like if you have your own bias going into like, if you're like writing a, a thesis after your focus group or whatever, and you have an argument that you're trying to make, but you want to have a focus group first, if someone, even if it's just like one out of 15 people, starts hinting at that argument, you might end up focusing on that person instead of the entire group, just to try to get the info you want. Yeah. So your facilitator, should he or she know anything about this research? A little bit. A little bit. But they shouldn't know what your goal is. The other reason is you want somebody who's trained in doing a focus group. Because you want to keep it moving. You don't want to go two hours and you only got through two or three of your seven questions. Because they just they didn't know how to keep it moving, moving from one point to the next. Okay. So you need somebody who's trained in it, somebody who's had some experience. Um, and then determine a location. Things that will help you with determining your location. Do you need audio-visual? It may be that you're just going in to ask questions. It may be that you're going to give them food samples and you want them to try it. It may be that you're showing them two different shows and you're trying to see their reaction to either one of them. But you need to determine the location so you know what additional audiovisuals you're going to need, the lighting, um, the comfort of the chairs. How many of you have ever been in the broadcast or the uh, the computer lab in Martin 125? You like the chairs in there? No. They like sitting on a tractor seat, right? Do I want to have a, a <laughs> do I want to have a focus group in there? Probably not. Focus group in here? Well, everybody but John will be okay with that. So. Just doesn't like the desks in here. I hate the desks. <laughs> but you need to think about those types of things. Think about where am I bringing my respondents from? If most of my respondents are going to be in Kansas City, at least Summit Blue Springs area, am I going to make them come here? Or am I going to go up to the Summit Center and have them meet me there where it's a closer drive? All right, so you need to think about those types of things. Whatever it takes so you can get better responses. Okay? Once you start doing it, set the tone. Keep it light. I don't want to come in and say, all right, your responses are going to have dramatic impacts on the way we teach digital media production at this university. It is vitally important that you give us your best answer, your most honest answer. Because if we get poor information from you, our program is going to fail. Eight of us, including myself, are going to lose our jobs. Oh, my God. Okay, let's have some fun. <laughs> yeah, let's set the tone. It needs to be relaxing. People need to feel like they can respond, that their input matters. Okay, so make sure you do that. Um, dig deep. You don't want just vague answers. 
This is a time where, again, we talked about the active listening when we're talking about the in-depth interview. Explain. Do you give me a response that's kind of vague? Well, I like it. We'll explain. What do you like? Tell me more. Draw them out. Make them give you some. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Sarah. Somebody else. And don't, uh, you know, you're not going to be up here going, yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah, I like that, Sarah. What, who else? Who else agrees with Sarah? <laughs> because if nobody else agrees with Sarah, you think Sarah's going to respond to anything else the rest of the focus group? If you know Sarah like I know Sarah, for Sarah to speak up in the first place, big deal. Okay. <laughs> So you want to be encouraging, but you want to just encourage a response. It doesn't matter what that response is. Any information you get is good information. Do keep track of your time. Again, we talked about it before. Keep track of your time. And keep track and head off if people have a personal agenda. <coughs> so, for instance, when we're doing our focus groups on, on the program, and as the students start going, a student, student starts going off about a specific professor, that's not really helpful. You're not going to make a decision on whether or not that professor stays. That's for another time. We're talking about the program and the classes and the extracurriculars that go with this program as a whole. That's what we're here for. Okay. All right? Questions so far? Sorry. How many of you have ever been a part of a focus group? When were you doing? It was, I don't know, a couple of years ago it was here. It was about... Uh, they took like the mass comm master students and the speech comm master students. Same sort of thing. Yeah. Program. yeah. Sarah? Um, I think it was actually for a graduate student's thesis and it was about um, religion and how much it affects our lives. Okay. Who else raised their hand? Uh, it was to try, well I went to two. One I remember was to try like a donut, like a new product. So, and another one was for like, um, I don't know, women and violence, something like that. Okay. What was the first one about what? To try a donut. Like a donut? A, yeah, a donut, like okay. a new product for women. So you got to eat them? Yeah. And then they asked you, so they brought samples of yeah. the different kinds, and you were supposed to give your feedback on them. Yeah. I like that <laughs> How come I didn't get invited to those? Okay. Mom, you said you've been um, one? When I first got in the Air Force, I got selected to try out a trial uniform a couple of weeks and then told them how I felt about it. Okay, so based on what we've talked about so far, how they do? How were those focus groups conducted? Did they do it right? Did they do it well? Did they screw anything up? It got, it got my attention that um, we were like in a room and there was a mirror that you couldn't see like through it, but the persons that were in love there, that. yeah, they, they were looking at you. Um, I don't know. I found I found that kind of intimidating because they also had like cameras everywhere, and especially with not the one with the donuts, but the one with the because they were at the same place. Um, with the one that we talked about, the different violence and, and home and the and woman and everything like that. That was kind of embarrassing <laughs> to yeah. say. Yeah, that one. That one explained Well, one of the villains that would be kind of tricky about how you phrase your question when you're giving people free food. Did you like it? Yeah, it was free. I loved it. Yeah, well, that's what you got to dig into. What did you like about it? Well, it was free. Okay, well, <laughs> stuff your donuts. You're not getting them for free. What the taste, the texture, the color, the icy. What, what, what did you like? What didn't you like about the taste, about the presentation? So yeah, you're gonna have to be careful how you, how you get the question. And that's something to think about. Is if you, if you entice them to come, if you pay them money, which sometimes happens in research, if you feed them. Are they going to feel like, oh, well, like, I don't want to say anything bad because he fed me. I don't want to hurt their feelings or anything. But, you know, that's, again, why you get six to 15 people. That You're not going to get 15 people who say, oh, well, I don't want to hurt their feelings by talking bad about them. Yeah. You're going to get those two or three or four people who say, oh, I didn't ask to be fed. They just fed us. I don't get my response. And as people are responding, more people will talk. 
So is it wise or preferable when you when the facilitator begins the presentation for him to identify? I've got no dogs in this fight. I'm just a facilitator. Yep. The answers will yep. no pay. pay yep. me. Your re your responses will help us in this manner. Feel free to say whatever you want to say. We're going to ask that you all be respectful of one another's opinions. But this is open forum. And we, we value your opinion. This is going to help us to create a better product. What happened? No, I wonder, <clears throat> I'm just throwing this out there, as probably if it would even work. If you, let's say with the donuts or even any other type of food, uh, if you set up like maybe four different focus groups, you're going to ask the same questions, but maybe with two of the groups, when you're setting them up to do the focus group and not actually have the focus group, they try the donuts. They sample all these different. Then in the focus group, you ask them those specific, specific questions. Then with the other two, they try the donuts during the focus group. And maybe, I mean, would that work as far as? It could. I think you can do to, for like manipulation checks and things like that to see if there's, yeah, you can do that. I didn't know if that would. That would possibly work. Just to see yeah, if their answers. They're, they're still both as groups as are still eating the donuts. They're still getting asked the same questions. Yeah. What are some of the things you need to be prepared for? Some of the cautions when you get to a focus group. Group think. Group think, which is what. When one dominant person says that they feel this way about whatever topic it is, and other people say, "Oh, I didn't think of that." Yeah, that's how I feel. Yeah, when you get somebody who starts speaking, and then you have to be the dominant person. <coughs> Typically is, because that person is, tends to speak more yeah. and speak longer. But somebody starts talking, and the rest of the group's like, oh, yeah, I hadn't thought of it that way. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what's another one? Maybe having a bad facilitator. Having a bad facilitator? Yeah, like maybe you just have someone that will just show up and just ask the questions and won't. We'll, Follow up on things, maybe like mispronounce things. I don't know. So yeah, they need to have some understanding of. Yeah, yeah. They don't pronounce things correctly. If they. Good afternoon. Thank you for being here. We're doing a study today. Um, we need to get some responses from you. So, question number one. Um, what's your favorite class? Okay. Thanks. Number two, you know, somebody who doesn't try and get more, you know, we're trying to get beliefs, attitudes, opinions, we're trying to get them, we're testing our assumptions, we want feedback, we want details. You have to draw that out of some people. So we've talked about you're going to get the dominant speaker, you're also going to get the speakers who really don't say much of anything. How do you get them involved? How do I go to Hannah, who hasn't said anything today, and say, Hannah, what do you think? Without Hannah going, crap, you put me on the spot. And I really didn't say anything because I didn't have anything to add. You don't want to do that to people, okay? But you still want to get everybody's responses. So you've got to figure out a gentle way of doing those types of things. Is going around in a circle common for focus group facilitators? Not really. Exactly. I mean, you can do the go around a circle and inter introduce yourselves. Yeah. But. In general, not. Yeah. Because what's going to happen then? What are you going to Bounce from topic to topic. So if somebody has something to add off of what somebody over here said, they can't say anything. This is not their turn. By the time it is their turn, they are not thinking about it. Anymore. Right. So that could happen. Or, I really don't have anything to add to this part. You know, I didn't even notice the costumes. I've got to come up with something now. And now you've forced a response out of somebody that really wasn't there. So you've got to be careful about that. Okay. Um, after you've done your focus group, and a couple things to think about while you're doing this, you can audio record it. You can video record it. That's fine. You can have the two-way mirror and be on the other side watching what's going on. Okay. You just need to make sure with your audience, with your, your participants, they understand this is being video recorded and audio recorded. We're going to keep it totally anonymous, but we need this to go back and make sure we get that collected properly. Okay. Clarify your notes right after. Clarify your notes right after. Why is that important? It's 
still fresh in your head. Yep, still fresh in your mind. You can remember what somebody said or how they said it. Um, you can start looking for some of those those themes that are emerging. Now, is this the facilitator that's doing this? This is you. So this, this is, is after I listen to it or watch it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because, I mean, if you think about it, we're video recording it, and if we don't do the two-way mirror, well, my first time there to watch it's going to be off the, the, the uh, playback anyway. Okay. If I am in the two-way mirror, I'm going to be making notes. I'm not writing down everything they say because I know I can go back to the, the video. But I can go through my notes and I can clarify things, make sure I can read everything. And that sounds kind of silly, but, you know, what, what did I write there? And you kind of think in context, oh yeah, that's what it was. And you try to look at the time, of where am I in this, so that when I do watch the recording play back, I know about where I need to go. Okay, so I don't miss it. Um, you want to summarize each meeting, talk about who was there, which group this was, were they interactive, was this one kind of standoffish, did this one get very animated, were they very passionate, were they angry, were they thrilled with all of this? Did we just do a screen of the movie Frozen and they love the characters, but my God, that song will not get out of my head now. And I didn't like it. Okay, it's one thing if the song is stuck in your head, you like it, right? It's another if that song is just, you hate it. You can't stand it. And it won't go away. It's a great song. What song am I talking about? Let it go. There you go. Hey, it's got to let it go. So I tell my kids all the time, honey, just follow Elsa's advice, just let it go. <laughs> And then write the report. Write it up. Because you've gotten all the information, you've gotten all the data, you've updated your results, or not updated your results, you've updated your notes so that you understand what it was you were saying. You're looking for those themes, now you just want to write it up. Okay? <coughs> Questions? Also another thing that uh, it's related to the subjects per se of the focus groups is that they don't have to know each other. The people coming to the focus group? Yeah, like no, they, they don't, don't have to know each other, they don't have to be friends or have a relationship, unless it is about that, but yeah. um, they don't have to know each other at all, so they don't have to, you know, be open, I mean, nothing. They um, speak better about what they are, the questions and everything. Is that true? And in some instances, it's best if they don't know each other. Okay. You know, I think about the focus groups we did with our students. Mm -hmm. That was a downside to it yeah. because they were pretty comfortable with one another and they could start talking amongst each other, amongst themselves, and, and giving each other grief. And, you know, that's going to shut something mm -hmm. down. Or if they know one another, and, uh, you know, I know Aaron, I don't like Aaron. And Aaron knows I don't like it, and I'm going to give my opinion, and Aaron's an idiot, and I'm not going to listen to Aaron's opinion. So Aaron may be like, I'm not going to speak up, because I don't want to be a lambasted after we come out of here. Okay, so that's, I'm just using Aaron as an example. Very big, big, big Aaron fan. <laughs> okay. What else? You see what these would be good Notice something here, too, we're talking about marketing. What kind of um, scholarly research do we do for that's marketing related? I mean, in our field, the communication. We don't really. This is, we don't really do marketing. We do communication. My point is, this what we're teaching you in qualitative and quantitative research is for scholarly efforts, for sure. It's also practical for professionals. Because some of you are going to go get your PhD. So you're not studying research methods so that you can become a researcher. <coughs> you're studying research methods so you can apply it in the professional world. And that's okay too. All right. Bob, you had a. Yeah, yeah, I just slipped out of my hand while I listened to the rest of out of my mind while I listened to the rest of it. <laughs> we do. Well, I say we don't do marketing, oh. scholar, uh, research here. We do it from a PR perspective. We do. Uh, we've got a new class that just started last uh, January called Neo Production. Are we doing surveys or anything, of, or any focus groups from students to see if they'd be a good idea? Just 
Okay, we did it. I think we did as a special topic to start out. And that's kind of what it's kind of a pilot test sort of thing. You do a special topic. If the students like it, okay, well, this one's going to work. Let's go ahead and add it. You know, we had 10 that time. We had seven the next semester. We got four now. So that's going to work. Yeah, it's five. Five? Okay, good. Are focus groups really the most objective kind of qualitative research? Because in the other ones, the whole point was you are the method and it is subjective. And here, you specifically are not supposed to be the one asking the questions. It's supposed to be more objective. Uh, no, 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 I understand that you're not the method. You're the tool for gathering the data. Versus the, if I'm doing a survey, the paper questionnaire is the tool that I'm using. The questions are here. Yes, I created it, but I'm sending that out. They're responding, and their responses are in concrete. It's a four, it's a five, it's a two, and they're giving you that back. You're the instrument in any kind of qualitative research because you're asking the questions or you're digging up the research, you're digging up the data, you're looking at the documents, and then you're interpreting what you see. So that's, that's the difference. Still with the focus group, I'm still interpreting their responses. You know, they may get really loud and rambunctious, and I may think that, oh, they're really enthusiastic about this. No, it may just be a snow day, and they're all fired up. You know, so I still have to kind of do some interpreting of um, what I'm seeing there. So I guess I don't really understand why it's important for you to do the interview, but it's important for you not to do the focus group. It's important. Why is it important for the researcher to be the interviewer, but it's oh. also important for the researcher to not be the facilitator? Okay, so if I do in-depth interviews, I'm, we're one-on-one, -on -one, and I, my focus is solely on you, okay? And then I'm interviewing John, and we're one-on-one, -on -one, and my focus is solely set here. So I've, I've got a singular focus because I'm only interviewing one person at a time. It's like John was saying, though, number one, with a focus group, if you're giving me the responses I think I want to hear, I'm more apt to keep calling on you and listening to you and let you speak for a while and then say, Kristen says something I don't agree with. It doesn't seem to jive with what I, my preconceived notion, my bias. Okay, thank you. Somebody else. I'm more apt to shut it <coughs> down. So I don't have to well, that'll listen. also happen in interviews long or short. It can, but I can. There's more of a chance that in a, in a group setting, I'm going to let one person or a group of people keep going on. If I'm doing interviews, they can speak as long as they want to and keep going. Now, I don't have to necessarily probe them to get more depth, but I think that's, that's just one of the reasons. The other reason is because there's so much going on. As if I've got a facilitator taking care of all of this, I can kind of sit back and watch the periphery. And then go back and watch the tape for actually the comments. And then the third reason is if I want a trained facilitator, somebody who's done this a lot. And when I say a facilitator, I'm talking about somebody who really knows what they're doing, how we can draw people out without just putting them on the spot. That makes sense? Why wouldn't it be good for you to get a trained interviewer in those other cases? Or, like you said, there's so much going on, that's why you record it. Why can't you be the facilitator and then? watch it later. I guess I don't see the difference. Well, in an interview, I want to be able to observe you and get the questions and get the responses from you. Okay, it's from an in-depth interview. If I'm, recording that, if I'm recording that whole thing, just the two of us, it's a little awkward to have just two of us on you. You can't keep track of what I'm saying and record, you know, audio record it to get my responses and do the observation just one-on-one. -on -one. I've been interviewed for a class, and we have it videotaped. I mean, it was weird because it was videotaped, but it wasn't any weirder than anything one. else. Yeah, it was one-on-one -on -one for the videotape. Were they videotaping for your response or videotaping for the, for the interviewer to critique the interview? Probably both. But... You can. I mean, you can do a one-on-one -on -one interview and just have, one, have somebody videotape it, but it's just not, not done quite as much. It's more audio. More than anything, with the reason you do the focus group is you're trying to get, one, it's convenience. Because I've got this set time frame, I've got a limited amount of time, and I can bring 15 people in versus me doing it by myself. Absolutely. Or, I, 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 I,
I get why focus groups are, are really more convenient, but I don't understand why you can't be a facilitator. Well, I'll, or, I'll tell you. Because I'll... the reasons that you have to have a facilitator, I don't understand why those reasons don't also apply to interviews. It's like there's the standard is completely different, and I don't know why. And the other reason that you know when you do a focus group, like when we did ours, one of the one of the drawbacks I felt when we did our focus groups, I was interviewing students in journalism and, and broadcast media. I teach journalism and broadcast media. Are they going to be as apt to answer me honestly if they don't like something that I'm doing? Versus if you were to come in that they didn't know and you're going to interview them and they're more apt to give you open responses. One of the, we went into one of the classrooms and the professor would not leave. And we knew that they did not like this professor. But they would not say anything about, and I don't want to bash on the professor, but they didn't like the class, they didn't like the approach, and he was the only one that taught this class. They weren't going to say anything negative in this focus group. They told me outside class, but they never did. So just, it kind of helps. I understand what you're saying, I understand what you're asking. I'm not sure I'm really giving you a good answer. Am I? <laughs> Somebody else, throw in something here, see if you can help it out. Oh, no, different question. I was going to say, um, it's all about credibility of your research. Your research is not going to be looked at as credible if you were the one running your focus group, because you can, like you said, twist the conversation any which way. Then why are interviews credible? Once again, he said it's easier. It's easier one on one for me to be more ethical with one person than to be ethical with a group of people. Especially as in, like as being a teacher, like as you know, I teach college, like I teach public speaking classes. I realized that it's easier for me to influence the entire group with one person, and that's a teaching strategy. So like, I'm directing my lesson to maybe this one person who's then responding back and other people are gaining knowledge off of that. If I'm in a focus group and I'm doing that with one person and it's engaging in group think is what she said. It's because people don't, aren't going to always want to speak up in those sorts of situations because I'm biased with my research. If I'm in an interview with someone, they're going to probably give me more unbiased responses because they don't have a group of people surrounding them. If we're, if we're speaking one on one, yeah, I can just you know, not probe for more depth if, it, if you start going somewhere where I don't agree and encourage you to just continue going on to something that I do. I'm less likely to do that one-on-one -on -one than I am with a group mm -hmm. because you can you can keep saying, well, no, I, I really think this can keep pressing that matter. If we're in a group, I can just shut you down and go answer somebody else and you're less likely to say, well, no, wait, 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 I had more to say on that. You're less likely to do that. Something else to think about is if I've got a focus group that goes for two hours, and I'm recording it, and I'm making notes while it's going on, so I got my two hours here. And then I go in real time and watch it play back. That's two more hours. So I've got about four hours invested in the focus group and doing the research. If I'm interviewing 15 individuals individually, and you and I talk for about 30 minutes, and then in real time I go back and watch it, that's an hour. And I've done that with 15 people. That's 15 hours. So you're more likely to be the person right there one-on-one -on -one doing the interview versus being in that focus group group. It's, I mean, it's done both ways. You, there certainly have been people who have been the researcher who have gone in to do the focus group themselves. You're just better off if you find somebody who's really trained. And that's more of it is getting somebody who's trained who knows how to control the time, um, keep people going, keep people moving on. If we start deviating, going off topic, bringing them back on topic, those types of things. It's all, and I feel like it's all based on your research question. Like, if your research question lends itself to a large group of people, you're probably going to want to lean towards a focus group. And if it lends itself to a... Not really. Not really? You don't no. think? Okay. Seems to me that the purposes are different, therefore the method is going to be different. In the focus group, you're trying to get a wide range of opinions and not influence it. But in an interview, you're the person who knows the subject that you're interviewing about. And you will know um, how to lead the, the responses into further questions where somebody who doesn't even know your subject matter would not know that, oh, that's critical, that's really, that's big, and might just get washed, um, swept right, or walked right over and not dealt with. Yes and no. If, if we do an interview, if I interview you individually and I've got 10 questions, I'm really trying to probe. Again, remember, in-depth interviews, you're really trying to get in-depth with your subjects 
get their, their heartfelt opinions, their beliefs, their feelings, and really dig deep with that person. And then put all those together. You're not going to dig as deep individually in here. Because if I've got seven, eight questions, I'm not going to get 120 responses. I'm not going to ask all 15 people to answer all eight questions. So I'm looking at a more broad, general from everybody here versus trying to get in depth with one individual person. I still don't feel like I'm getting. It's okay. I mean, I, I, so I understand exactly what you're saying, because I mean, in any kind of research you do, you can bias the results. You just have to check that at the door. But when you've got a large group that you're, that's diverse, if you've got a trained facilitator who knows what he or she is doing to keep the conversation going, to make sure that they don't get off track, to make sure that one person doesn't dominate the entire conversation, you're going to get better results than if you're the one doing it and you find you get yourself locked in. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. She's got that. That's a great point. That's great. Okay, thank you. And then we're gonna come back over here. Okay. Um, how much is the facilitator supposed to know or understand about what the researcher is looking for, so that the facilitator doesn't also become as a biased? researcher? What are you looking for? You said, how much do they know about what the researcher is looking for? What are you looking for? You're looking for information. You're looking for data. You're not looking for a point of view, necessarily. Is that, if I'm interpreting you correctly. They should know, these are, they should be able to figure out, I mean, if it's, if it's somebody of half a brain, they should be able to figure out from your questions, this is what they're after. Okay. And so when they're... They shouldn't know what your preconceived notions are. They shouldn't know what your assumptions are. Okay, they shouldn't know that. No, because why? Because then they'll, they will do the same thing the researcher would do. There's a good chance that they'll do that. Yeah. I'm assuming I this. Okay. Yep, that, that matches the assumption. No, nope, that one disagrees. Okay, go on. Tell me more. So when the facilitator is probing to, to keep the conversation going, they, they don't know what your assumptions are. They're just... Just yeah, and in the focus group, really, you shouldn't have to do that much probing because the, the participants will do a lot more than that. Okay. The only time you really probe is if they don't really say anything or if they just give a brief answer. Yeah. What did you like about the costumes? Well, they were pretty. Colorful, nice lace. Were they uh, designed well? What, what made them pretty? You know, that's... That's when you'd have to probe. You wouldn't probe like that. You would just go on. So, so, so they can be, the facilitator can be flexible, but because they don't know what your assumptions are, if they, they don't know what your assumptions are, then they don't run the risk of skewing the results. Yeah. When, when they're probing. It's all about eliminating as much bias as you can going in. So you make sure you don't taint or sway the conversation. <coughs> Again, it can happen with an in-depth interview <coughs> that I can decide, I'm not going to probe on that one, that's not the response I'm looking for. But again, it all comes back to the old... got to be ethical. You're not here to promote your agenda. You're here to find what's out there. The why. Okay? 